This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show. Once again, my name is Tim Flattery, and our Moonlighter for today is a two time Moonlighter. He is back on the podcast for the second time. His name is Scott Shebler. Now, Scott Shebler, the very first time I saw him, he was playing college baseball for DMAC, Des Moines Area Community College. He's originally from Shueyville, Iowa, went to Cedar Rapids Prairie High School. But back when he played for DMAC, I saw him play against my beloved Iowa Central Tritons, and my younger brother, Joey, was pitching for Iowa Central at the time, and Scott Shebler hit an absolute bomb of a home run off my brother, Joey, and at the time... I remember being absolutely awestruck by the bat speed of Scott Shebler. This guy was an absolute man. He was an absolute dude in junior college baseball, and I hadn't seen bat speed like that out of a JUCO guy in a long time, maybe ever. And sure enough, just a couple of years after Scott Shebler was at DMAC, he made his debut in the major leagues with the Los Angeles Dodgers back in 2015. And we talk about what it was like to play for the Dodgers, to play for the Cincinnati Reds. He joined the Cincinnati Reds in 2016, played with them from from 2016 to 2019, and he was on the Braves this past year, but only had one at bat with the Braves this past year. And the reason I wanted to get Shebler back on the pod is because he spent most of this season at the alternate training site for the Braves. So as you guys know, there was no minor league baseball in 2020, but all of these teams kept their major league reserves essentially and their best minor league players off site at these training sites where they would play inter-squad games and stay in shape to get ready to get called up to the big club at any time. So hearing his perspective on what those alternate training sites were like this season, I thought we had to get, tell that story here on the Moonlight Graham Show. And the other unique thing about Shebler is he is only the second Iowan to ever hit 30 home runs in a season of Major League Baseball. Hal Trotsky actually did it three times. Hal Trotsky from Norway, Iowa, hit 42 home runs one season, 35 home runs another season, and 32 home runs a third season. And Scott Shebler, back in 2017 with the Reds, he hit 30 home runs. He's hit 61 career home runs, and 30 of them came back in his 2017 season. The next on that list is Casey Blake, who his career high for home runs in a season was 28. So Shebler is only one of two Iowans ever hit over 30 home runs. He's had injuries kind of play, come into his career over the last couple of years, but I hope next year, 2021, he's back healthy. He's back with a full season in the big leagues. And it was fun to get him here on the podcast once again. And if you like what we're doing here on the Moonlight Graham Show, guys, subscribe to our podcast wherever it is that you get your podcast. And we would love it if you left us a five star review. You can also follow the show, of course, on social media Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Visit our website at Moonlight Graham Show. Com and enjoy today's episode with Moonlighter Scott Shebler. But before we get to our episode, I want to talk to you about a new partner of ours. It's called the Underdog Newsletter. So the Underdog Newsletter is an email newsletter that you can sign up for online. Here's what it is. It's a bite-sized rundown of the best underdog stories in sports. You guys know we're all about the underdogs here on the Moonlight Graham Show. And what these guys do, they sift through thousands of stories each and every week and handpick the best underdog stories and deliver them into your email inbox each and every week. They deliver it the same time the Moonlight Graham Show comes out every Tuesday morning. And these guys over at the Underdog Newsletter, they celebrate the long shots, the rejects, the misfits, beating the odds and overcoming adversity. I don't know if there's a better email subscription list that you can sign up for than the Underdog Newsletter. Here's how you find them. You head over to www.jokermag.com backslash newsletter, or to make it even easier, all you have to do is type in Underdog Newsletter into Google, sign up for the Underdog Newsletter. It'll come into your inbox every Tuesday morning and let them know the Moonlight Graham Show sent you. I guarantee that you'll enjoy this underdog newsletter each and every week. Check them out, guys. You know, obviously, uh, you know, you've been on the Moonlight Graham Show, so you know, you know the podcast. Yep. We are partnering, of course, with Des Moines Area Community College for uh, this string of interviews here. And you are, you know, you're a DMAC alum, Scott. I am, yes. 
Are you the only guy ever to make the major leagues out of DMAC? Ooh, that's a good question. I have uh, – that's a – it's a question probably for uh, Dan Fitzgerald, the head coach that was there. I know we got a, we had a lot of guys drafted out of there, but I don't know. I know none of the guys that I got drafted with in like th- that three year span. I got obviously I knew the guys coming in that were sophomores, and then that none of those guys made it. But maybe somebody back in the day. I have no idea. Yeah, I was I was looking at it, and nobody I couldn't find it. But there might be somebody from way back when. when yeah, that's the only thing I could think is like way back when. But then again, I don't know if DMac had a baseball program. I don't know when they started that. Well, didn't they have? Didn't was it John Smith that coached there forever? Does that? Yeah, John Smith. So he showed time? up to practice. Yeah, he showed up to practices. Uh, Fitz like let him come by the practices and all that stuff. So I actually got to know him pretty well. He was, I mean he wasn't a coach at the time. So he was really cool, but I heard he was kind of, he was kind of tough as a coach is what I've heard. Yeah. He was an old school baseball guy from everything. Yeah. I've heard. Yep. For sure. Yeah. I played actually for Fitz for the Waterloo Bucks. So I played oh, okay. for Fitz coach for the Waterloo Bucks. I played for him. That was like right before he went down to DBU. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's kind of been all over the place. I know he tried to, he tried to manage or, or be around, as much pro ball as possible. Cause he really, he did a really good job connecting himself with like pro scouts and, and guys like that. So like when I went to DMAC, obviously I wasn't getting recruited by anybody, but he did a good job of saying like, you know, we get guys drafted out of here, which is unheard of for DMAC to get, I think my year alone, we had like two or three guys drafted, which is kind of crazy out of a junior college in Des Moines. So yeah, I was looking at those stats today from that team you guys hit 108 home runs in like 50 some games it's incredible how much power you guys had on that team. we like I don't know we just we choked obviously we should have like that was by far the best team that they had there um but we just we just ran into um who was I think it was southeastern that ended up beating us and then like the team that ended up going to the World Series that year, we swept in the regular season. Like, and it wasn't like I think we ten run ruled them like three out of the four games. It was something ridiculous like that. So, yeah, what was it? Did you guys just run into a bus? <sighs> everybody got cold on the same day. I think everybody got cold on the same day, and then they they ended up having like one one pitcher that just kind of knew what he was doing. And I don't know. I just like just that's the crazy thing about baseball is like especially with the playoff format like this year. I'm really interested to see how that works out because. You know, an eight seed and a one seed matching up, like for a three game series, you know, if you just have three good starters, you have a potential to, to make it through, honestly. Oh, yeah. You look at like the Marlins right now. Yeah. Like, some of the guys the Marlins are running out there on the mound in a three game series, you don't want to think. Th- yeah. In a three game series, like it's anybody's game. It's just when you get into that seven game series, you know, the Marlins aren't going to compete. But a three game series, anybody can compete for that, especially if you like. Like the Braves, for instance, you know, if they don't – I mean, I think Freed's coming back and all that, but their bullpen – they could rely on their bullpen for one game, you know, just kind of do a bullpen day if they needed to. I don't know if the, they obviously don't want to do that, but they could if they needed to. Yeah, so let's let's move back a little bit. You're from Shueyville, Iowa. Yeah. And I looked up Shueyville today. It's a population of 655, which surprisingly yep. it's been growing. It had a population of like 150 – in 1880, and it's on, it's on the growth. So what's the best thing about Shueyville? The best thing about Shueyville? Oh, man. I, I You know, it was kind of cool growing up out there. You know, I had a lot of – I went to Prairie, so I had a lot of farmer friends and, and all that. But that area is, like, exploding because it's it's perfect. It's, like, 15 minutes from Cedar Rapids, 15 minutes from Iowa City. So it's kind of in that perfect little spot that you can kind of get both cities. And, yeah, like, where my parents' house is – the area is just exploding. Like there's houses going up everywhere. So it just seems like, you know, a lot of people are wanting to move into that area. And I mean, the growth's been exponential, especially that North Liberty area. That's where every, every time I come back, um, there's new exits like that forever green exit now is there. And then like there's high V's in places. I never thought there would be a high V's, you know, it used to be a cornfield kind of a thing. So it's cool to explore the area. Like when I, when I get to come home for sure. You mentioned it earlier that not a lot of people were looking at you coming out of high school. Yeah. Was it one of those things where DMAC was the only option or was this like, I'm going to wait out to see if I can get some D1 offers? You know, you're right down the road from the University of Iowa. What was that process like to end up at Yeah. D1? So, um, honestly, I thought I was going to play football. 
um, and then decided against that. Thank goodness. But yeah, DMAC was really the only one um, offering. And it was funny because uh, Fitz was like, he would come to like my basketball games and my, my soccer games. And he was just like recruiting way too heavily. And I just remember my mom and my dad saying to him, like, I don't know why you're here. Like nobody else is recruited. You're trying too hard. Like, you know what I mean? But he's like, I, he, he just believed in me. And he's like, you know, I'm not going to let this guy go anywhere else kind of a deal. And, and I, I told him, I was like, I haven't talked to anybody. Like, you're literally the only guy that's shown interest in, in the baseball realm. Like, I had some football interest and all that. But um, once I decided to go baseball, he was really my only option, which is weird because, you know, I came up playing with Kellen and, and perfect game and all that. But, you know, I just never – I don't. I think I just didn't, like, specialize in baseball at that point. So, perfect game didn't really – you know, they didn't put me out there like they did for Kellen. What was your expectation then coming into DMAC? Because it didn't take too long for you to be like, man, I can, I can play here at college baseball. I can do pretty well here. Yeah. Um, well, the one thing that Fitz kind of said to me is like, you know, we, we don't want you for two years. Like we're going to get you out of here either to a D1 program after the first year. And that was obviously, you know, appetizing for me. I was like, I don't really want to spend too much more time in Boone than I have to. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of knew going in that I was probably only going to spend one year there. Um, and then I got a couple D one offers, um, before the, the spring season even started. So, um, I was pretty happy with how things went. Um, like, like I said, he was, he's so well connected and honestly, it felt now that I'm in the, you know, the, the pro, uh, world, he kind of runs it like a GM does. It's kind of crazy because, I just remember times at practice, like he would have the other coaches run it and he'd be on the phone like for like three or four hours straight, which is like what a GM does. He's just talking and networking. And, you know, at the time I was like, dude, like we're having practice right now, but he literally would be on the phone three or four hours during practice. Cause there's no practice limitations at DMAC. So we practice forever. Right. Um, but he'd be on the phone and just taking phone call after phone call. But so he kind of ran it like a GM. Like he was just like always networking and always trying to get guys to come into the program and then get guys out of the program. Cause he, he understood that like to get guys to come at DMAC, you need to put them, you need to put them places. And he was putting people in, you know, he had people going to Auburn. He had people going to college of Charleston, these big time programs. So, you know, most guys coming in are like, all right, I just need to do my thing, get out of here, you know, and just kind of move on. Yeah. So, we had talked about it last time you were on the podcast, but you hit a home run off my brother, Joey, at Ed Barber in Fort Dodge on like an O2 <laughs> pitch. And it might be one of the farthest home runs I've ever seen hit. And it was, I think, in the first inning of that okay. game. You guys jumped all over him. You remember that? Oh, man. Was it? Uh... He was the lefty for Iowa Central. He, might have been yeah, so I think we went back to back to – I think we hit four in a row off of him. Yeah. And it was but funny it was because – I, I mean, I don't remember it too well. I remember hitting the home runs and, and the back-to-back-to-back, to back to back, but I remember him being super pissed about a pitch that he didn't get a call on right. by me, which, you know, the umpires were terrible in that league, so I, he probably got that stuff all the time. But And then the next pitch, he just grooved one. And then the rest is just like – it kind of – it fell apart for Iowa Central after that. I, I just remember – I remember batting practice that weekend, and it was a terrible idea because some coaches like – their players to stick around and watch the other teams BP and all that stuff. And we put on a show like everywhere we went, like it was just ridiculous. And I swear we beat Iowa central in batting practice. Like they were just like, they had the pitching staff watching us just like launch these, but like, it was just, I thought it was a bad call for them to just sit around and watch our BP, especially after watching their BP. It was like, it was night and day, the difference. Well, yeah. Cause the game turned into a home run derby then. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it was funny. Cause I had never seen a team sit around and watch another team's batting practice. Cause and pro, pro ball, we don't do that. Like we're always in the clubhouse, like very, you know, if there's a Stanton or something, you'll go out and watch a couple of rounds, but you're not like oon and on, but they were like, they watched, I don't know if it was a coaching thing, but they watched our entire BP. And I was, I just remember talking to Fitz. I was like, that's a, that's a terrible idea, especially for our batting practice like that we put on. Right. So Yeah, you guys had so many pro prospects there swinging with metal on small yeah. fields. Like it's yeah. Good. yeah, the metal bat was not fair for that league, to say the least. Yeah, especially like Nyack's field in Iowa State yeah. the right day. Balls can fly out of those places. Oh, yeah. I mean, we I think we averaged like something like 10 or 11 runs a game in a seven-inning game. So, it, uh, yeah, it, was, it got out of hand a lot of times for us as offense. 
So, Scott, you've hit like 60 bombs in the big leagues now. What's the one home run that, that sticks in your head as like the, the farthest ball you hit or the one that you oh, always think about going back on? I mean, I, I think I always probably just remember my first one um, in San Diego. Um, yeah, he threw me a, a change up in and just – he tried to – he tried to go fastball and then change up in. And, you know, I had so much adrenaline running that day just because, you know, I think it was my second or third game in the big leagues or something like that. And, I mean, I just connected on one and it went. They said that it would have been a home run in the old Petco Park. That's what they yeah, told me. Yeah, because that so. used to be a pitcher's park. Yeah, it used to be. Now it's now it's a little better. I swear every year they move the fences in a couple of feet. So, but, yeah, that was probably – that one and then, like, uh, I hit one in San Francisco – couple years ago that I remember that actually is kind of crazy it hit a guy in the eye that was in like so it was dead dead center and it was like 15 20 rows deep and dead center in San Francisco which is a pretty good bullet and it, I remember it hit a guy in the eye because he tagged me in on Instagram and Twitter he's like dude you hit my eye and it was like <laughs> it was it was pretty bad looking like black eye it was pretty intense so clearly I hit it good enough that I had enough steam when it got out that far you know, to do some damage still, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, you made your debut, of course, with the Dodgers, you know, one of the yep. most famous organizations in, in really, you know, the whole sports world, right? Everybody yeah. knows the Dodgers. What, did you ever get a chance to meet Vin Scully? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, I met him multiple, multiple times. Pro, I mean, one of the best guys. I mean, there's I've, I've never heard a bad word ever, ever said about that guy. He, you know – you know, here I was like a rookie and he was just, he was, it seemed like he was happy to meet me, which was interesting because I, I was like, you know, the, it was completely opposite. Like I was so happy to meet him, but I think he just had a joy about him, you know, that like when he broadcasted and when he met people, you just like, I don't know, just so genuine, I guess you would say. And, you know, after doing it for as long as he did, he still wanted to meet the rookies and it was just, it was just a really cool experience. Yeah. What do you say to a guy like that? Like, Man, you just try to – I don't know. I feel like people probably feel like they're bugging him all the time by asking about stories, but that's what you want to do. You want to hear the stories. Like, the guy was in Brooklyn, you know, and he, he, he yeah. broadcasted Brooklyn games. So, it was it was funny because he would always come to chapel, and I, I'm sure he got annoyed of it because I, th- I felt like he started coming later and later to chapel. So, um, guys would try to get to chapel early to, to talk to him. And then pick, and then chapel would start and people would be like still kind of like talking to him about stories and stuff when chapel was starting. So um, he started showing up later to chapel, which I don't blame him because I feel like everybody was going to chapel early just to talk to him about old stories and all that. It's crazy. Like he just got on Twitter. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, I didn't. I, I, I'm not even on Twitter anymore. Oh, yeah. I mean, so. it's a hell so I don't blame you. <laughs> but, uh, he just got on Twitter like last week. Just okay. to sit in his rocking chair in a suit and tie and tell old Dodger stories. Like when Clayton Kershaw pitches, he'll tell a Clayton Kershaw story. Or like yeah. when some moment in history comes up, it's Vin in his rocking chair telling – his, he was there. His, memory, like his memory has to be just crazy. Like, I mean, he just remembers details too. Like little – small details that he just he never forgets it it's wild because you'll ask him a story about you know the 70s and he like knows all the details the the count like everything which is insane and I you know I know I do a pretty good job of remembering my own at bats like the counts the you know pictures and all that stuff but I couldn't imagine trying to remember everybody else's at bats you know and that's that's pretty impressive to me yeah it I mean Vin Scully is just like this legendary guy oh but you've had the chance to play, you know, for now the Braves and the Reds and the Dodgers. Like some guys, yep. you know, their their career is like they play for the Rays and the Marlins. Yeah, it's exactly. Not historic teams. You've had a chance to play for three of the best franchises ever. You got to feel a little bit lucky about that. Yeah, for sure. And, and the Reds obviously weren't weren't quite. You know, that was kind of where I got my opportunity because the team was not quite. You know, it was in a rebuilding phase, which you know it was a blessing to get there and do that. Um, but yeah, the Braves, you know, they've got how many, they won like what, 13, 14 pennants in a row or something oh, yeah, crazy like guys. that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, um, yeah, I've been in some good organizations, so, um, I'm with the Braves now and I'm, I couldn't be happier. They, uh, so this is a really good organi- organization. It's ran very, very well. So I'm excited and, and hopefully, you know, hopefully I'll be here next year. 
When was the moment coming up? I know you had a really great single-A season where you won the minor league play of the year. When yeah. was the moment kind of on your way up that you thought, you know what, maybe, maybe I can get to the major leagues and stick around a while? Yeah, um, you know, it was kind of crazy. It, it took me a while, um, you know, because I was playing with – I mean, the Dodgers, obviously, their system – you know, I was playing with guys that were just really good. I was playing with Jock. I was playing with Corey Seager. I was playing with all these guys. And I'm like, you know, it kind of became a thing like, how long can I hang on? You know, like, can I, can I kind of hang with these guys? Cause you kind of, you knew early on those guys were going to be really good big leaguers. And, and once I started figuring out like, okay, like I can kind of hang around these guys and, you know, I can play, you know, maybe not quite to that level, but, you know, just a little bit underneath. I think that gave me confidence, you know, just playing with those guys and knowing like, all right, you know, he's hitting third, I'm hitting fourth. Like clearly there's something to that. Um, So I think just playing around good players, it just helped me um, because it gave me that. And there's always competition within teammates, you know? And and so I, I don't know if there was a point in time that I remember. I do remember early on being like, you know, I remember calling my dad and being like, dude, like, you know, I made a mistake. Like these guys are way too good. And, uh, you know, he kind of, he kind of talked me off the ledge there a little bit. And I would say probably, probably that year that I won that, you know, it was like validation, like, okay, I was playing with some really good players and they decided that I was the player of the year. So I just think that that gave me the confidence going into double A, which that jump from low A to double A is kind of, you know, that's, that's a difference maker. If you can hit in double A, especially in the Southern league, you know, they, they really see you as a prospect that can play in the big leagues. Like you could put up all the numbers you want in, in low A, but if you don't do it in double A, you're never going to get a chance. So I think I took that confidence into the double A and had a really good season after, after the season uh, previous. So um, I would say probably around halfway through that double A season, I was like, okay, you know, I, I got a really good chance to make it. Yeah. And now Scott, you mentioned that you, you're not on Twitter. But no. I, and I don't blame you for not being on Twitter, but one of my favorite Twitter follows is Pitching Ninja, which I'm sure okay. you're familiar with. And every day, you know, Pitching yeah. Ninja, he takes like the best clips from every pitcher. And it'll be like Jacob deGrom throwing a 100-mile-hour fastball yeah. followed by a 94-mile-an-hour slider, followed yeah. by like a 91-mile-an-hour changeup or something. And I'm thinking there's no way I could ever hit any of this stuff. Sometime when you're at the plate against one of those guys, like whether it's a DeGrom or a Clayton Kershaw or one of these guys that you see on Pitching Ninja all the time, yeah. you ever feel like there's no ch- – I have no chance or I'm overmatched? I don't know if it's a no chance. You definitely feel overpowered. Like, but the thing is you know going into it. Like those guys aren't surprising anybody. That's, that's the crazy part is like you know that – they know that they're getting the best out of the hitters and they're still doing that. You know what I mean? Like – it's not like some guy coming off the street and you kind of don't know what to expect. You know what you to expect and they're still doing it. That's the impressive part. But there's some guys when they're on, they're just, you're not going to hit them. And, and I mean, as crazy as that is to say, but you've seen it. Like there's once those guys are on DeGrom and Kershaw, there's really not much you can do. It really isn't, you know? Yeah, do you go you, up there like, what's your plan against the guy? Do you come up there looking for one sometimes, pitch the spot? Or? Sometimes it's, it's nice to kind of like, just go into a two strike approach from the get go, you know? Um, But I mean, what has helped me against those guys is just like, you know, you really want to hunt a small spot, you know, like honestly, and this is crazy. It's like, you kind of want to sit middle, middle. It's really the only chance you have. Like you're not going to hit this, this bastard slider that, that nicks the edge. Like you're not going to hit that anyway. So, you know, to set your six, they, they still make mistakes. DeGrom's still throwing 100, but he's going to make a mistake down the middle. Um, so if you're not – I mean, those are the like, – you, right. you got you got to sit, like, middle. middle. you got to really, like, hone in on a spot that you're like, okay, I don't care if it's 101. I can still hit it in this spot kind of a deal because the other stuff, you're just – like, you're really setting yourself up for failure if you're doing that. Yeah, if you go up there trying to cover the whole strike zone against those guys, in all yeah. cases, you got no chance you got no chance. So you really gotta, you gotta be very specific on what you're hunting and then hope, hope to God you don't miss it because they, they do make mistakes. Don't get me wrong. Like the nice, the the thing about throwing a hundred is you can make mistakes and, and get away with it. So on a guy like Kershaw, who's not throwing 94, 95 anymore, you know, that's why you're going to see him do so well. It's because 
he does command it. And that's why he was so good when he was throwing 94, 95 is he could command it. So that guy, I mean, he's going to be around for a very, very long time still just because he commands the ball so well, but a guy like DeGrom, you know, he makes mistakes, but it's just so hard. I mean, it's so hard to like, you might get one pitch and if you miss it, you're, I don't know, you're just hanging on for dear life a little bit. So Scott, what's, what's day to day like right now? Cause it's, we're in the middle of a pandemic yeah. Uh, no fans are at games. You're at like the alternate site right now. You mm-hmm. mentioned earlier before we started recording that you get the schedule like the night before. So like, what is, what is your life like? Well, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's kind of a pitcher's camp, obviously, you know, we're, we're, we're not playing against other teams, you know, so we're trying to, you know, we get the schedule the night before we get tested every other day. Um, so we'll get our schedule, wake up in the morning or wake up in the afternoon, depending on what the schedule looks like. And, we'll figure out who's pitching that night. And it's just kind of, you know, you go to the field, you, you lift, you do your batting practice. Um, it rains here a ton. So it feels like we're never on the field. Um, we're always getting rained out of stuff, but essentially it's a pitcher's camp. And as you've seen this year, it's like what staff can stay healthy. You know, there's the pitching is just, you know, kind of wild this year. If you're a pitcher, it's a really good year to be in the big leagues. Cause right. you're going to get a chance. You're going to get a chance. So, um, you know, we, we do like some simulated like live BPs where we hit off pitchers, but it's, it's not very realistic, but it, it's better than nothing. Like I'm not trying to downplay it. It's, it's not ideal, but in this year, it's as, I mean, the Braves have set it up to, to, for us to be the most successful we can as hitters. Like they've set it up really well. And, um, you know, it's just not realistic because you're not, you're, you know, you're, when do you ever face your own teammates every day, you know, and you're facing the same guys over and over and over again. So it's not super realistic, but I, I will, I will say the Braves have done a good job of making it as realistic as possible. Are you guys watching the Braves every night? Cause at this point there's like two <clears throat> weeks left of the regular season. So it's the pennant chase already so yeah. are you watching the Braves and following that every day. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's really not much else to do. We're kind of, I, I, I want to say we're not technically in a bubble, but we're kind of, you know, we're not obviously – they don't want us going out to dinner or, you know, going out to the bars or anything like that. Like, we're still in somewhat of a quarantine because um, if one of us gets it, we can obviously contract it to everybody else. So, you know, it's it's our own little bubble. So, it's like hotel to the field. So, I mean, there's really not a whole lot else to do. I think that's the, the biggest thing that we've talked about at the field. It's more of like mentally how, how can you stay, you know – Right. Awake and, and just like mentally be there every day. Cause it's tough. Like, I mean, and, and everybody's kind of going through it in the, in, in the world right now. It's like, you know, you would like to get out and do stuff, but you just, you're just not really able to. Um, so the mentality is a little different this year, but uh, I mean, two weeks left, I think everybody's kind of itching to get towards the playoff run so we can at least see some playoff baseball at the very least. What's, what's the favorite stadium that you've ever played in? Oh man. Uh, I mean, I would have to say Dodger Stadium probably is. I mean, it's unbelievable. They do a really good job there. Uh, that, or, I mean, Yankee Stadium is awesome as well. But I think just coming up with the Dodgers, I think playing in Dodger Stadium was by far the best. Yeah, and, and Dodger Stadium is like an L.A. thing too. Yeah. Like everybody's got I the mean, Dodger hats on. They love going to the Dodger games. It's like such yeah, a thing to do out in L.A. It is an atmosphere, man. It is it is wild. And, and that, that stadium is so big. I think it holds like 65,000. So it's like a football game. I mean, if they Friday night, Saturday night, it feels like a football atmosphere. It's just, it's not something you ever really see in other stadiums because, you know, they don't hold 65,000. But, you know, going to like a college football game and knowing that atmosphere, Dodger Stadium is probably as close to that atmosphere as, as, as it gets to like college football. Yeah. So, Scott, you, you of course played junior college baseball at DMAC, and life on the road of a JUCO is something that you, you can only. <laughs> if you went to juco so what yep. like go to junior college meal on the road was it like subway mcdonald's like what was the, the oh it was uh, mcdonald's because i think our coaches got free meals if they brought a bus and that the i think it was any place that our coach and our bus driver got free meals we would stop at and i'm pretty sure if you pretty sure mcdonald's is if you bring a bus the driver or the coach eats free or something like that like there's something to it so I want to say we ate at McDonald's a lot. 
That is so funny because I remember that from being in high school, but yep. I don't remember that. But it's hilarious that you guys were doing that in college too. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, T Mac wasn't throwing throwing money our way. Trust me to to feed us on the road. I mean, I'm not saying I had a bad time at D Mac, but that's just not that wasn't in the budget, you know. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, I remember a lot of bus trips, a lot of McDonald's. I mean. I want to, what was the one place? What's the one buffet place that's, oh man. What's Ponderosa? Did you guys ever stop yeah. at Ponderosa? No, not Ponderosa. I can't remember. It's a buffet place. It's just one of the most, the generic. Golden Corral? Golden Corral. Wow. We spent a lot of time at those too. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. I love that. So you've been in the bigs. We mentioned Vin Scully earlier. You've been with the, we said the the Dodgers, the Reds, now the Braves. Who's like the one guy that you've met that you've been starstruck with? Starstruck with. Oh, um, I would say, uh, I mean, I grew up a Cardinals fan, so I was a big Albert fan growing up. So playing against him multiple times, like the first time I played against him, like, I don't know, that was, that was pretty surreal. Like that was a moment that I was, you know, I was a kid when he was first in the big leagues. Like I, I think right. I was, I don't know, 10 maybe when you started, I mean, he's, 40 now something like that 10 8 to 10 and I don't know I was like I don't know it's cool like I got on first base and you know kind of gave me like hey like good job kind of it was like I don't know I try I tried not to I'm sure I I seem giddy to to meet him but I'm sure he got that all the time like with how good he was in St. Louis like he I guarantee all the young guys coming up like that was their favorite player actually it's funny because uh we just signed Pablo Sandoval and he I came saw to that. our camp. Yeah. yeah, he came to our camp today, and it's just funny because you know he's not that much older than me, so I didn't really idolize him as much because I wasn't a young kid. But a lot of the youngsters at the camp are like, "Dude, that's like my that that was my guy." And I was, it's just funny to see that them like we've had this one kid in camp, and like Pablo was this guy growing up, and he was like, "I can't believe he's here! I can't believe he's here!" And he's like, "He's in the we have separate clubhouses, and he's a younger guy, so he's in the other clubhouse." and he like any excuse to come to our clubhouse to see what Pablo's doing. He'll do it. It's so funny. It's but but I probably would have been the same way if Albert was in our camp and when when I was you know twenty one. So uh, it's just kind of funny to see. But um, yeah, Pablo's been that way for a couple of the guys in our camp with with the Braves so far. Pablo, yeah, the Kung Fu Panda. I mean, that he's guy awesome. Is he is he, he is, pr- and I've only met him a couple times before. Obviously, being teammates with him now, but guy's awesome. He is he is awesome. He's a great dude. So you're an Eastern Iowa guy. Obviously, the Field of Dreams is in Eastern Iowa. Was that a regular stop for the Shebler family growing up? I think I've only been there once, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because uh, um, obviously the movie and all that. Um, but people always ask me, like, you know, that's like their number one thing. If I meet somebody in baseball and they're like, oh, from Iowa, that, that's their number one thing. It's like, have right. you been to the Field of Dreams? I'm like, yeah, I've been. And they're like, it would have been really cool to see that that game go on, you know. That would have been uh, – I think a lot of people were probably pretty frustrated with how that went. Um, so, I think we'll get it next year. I think, I think so, too. I mean, they built the stadium. and I think if we have a regular year next year, that will definitely happen. I just don't – I don't know if they – I just thought it was cool that they got the Yankees of all the teams, you know, like what well, are they the were doing it right. Yankees White Sox is perfect. Yeah, it's literally, it was the perfect game. Like they, yeah. they got the right teams and, and it's so funny to see like the Yankees playing Buffalo against Toronto, like in a triple A stadium. Like in my mind, that's so weird to see, you know, the, the best franchise in baseball history play in a triple A ballpark. It's just kind of, it's just, it's, it's perfect for this year. If like that says this, this year, perfect. Like they're playing in Buffalo, you know, it's just kind of funny. Yep. So we're partnering of course, for this interview with DMAC and yep. we brought up DMAC a lot. So if you're talking to the DMAC baseball team, Scott, what advice would you, you give to them right now, knowing that, you know, they've had, they had their season cut short last year. They're going to have a weird fall. You know, it's been a weird year for, for junior college guys. You've been there. What advice would you give to those guys? Yeah. Um, shoot, I'm trying to think of what I was thinking when I was there and how, how young I was, but, you know, I enjoyed my time. I, I thought the best part about DMAC was, you know, we didn't have a whole lot else besides our team. So like our team camaraderie, camaraderie was great. Like we did everything. So I think that like 
baseball wise, that was probably some of the most fun I've ever had playing baseball. Like you spent 24 seven with them cause they were your roommates. We played video games. Like it's like kind of the time of your life. So I would just say live it up and obviously, you know, get better and all that, but just, I don't know. I had so much fun at DMAC. Like we had such a good team and um, we, obviously the living arrangements were, were pretty awesome. Like we were, it was pretty much like we had our own hotel at our team. It was, it was pretty cool. And then, I mean, going to school and all that, but it was, uh, you know, I really enjoyed my time at DMAC for sure. So I would just tell them, you know, enjoy it because it's, uh, you know, it's a fun environment to play baseball with your buddies. And, and once, you know, if they go somewhere else, it might not be the same. Like not every clubhouse is the exact same. So I would definitely just say, enjoy, enjoy your time there. Yeah. It goes quick. It young, does. Yeah. Yeah. When you're young. It doesn't seem like it, but then when you look yeah. back on it, it's like, man, and you're like, man, those were really fun cool. times. Yeah. Those yeah. were fun times. So yeah, I, I was only there a year, but it was, uh, I, I really enjoyed my time there at DMAC for sure. Well, Scott, thanks so much for joining us. I know you're a busy man right now. The Braves are in the middle of the pennant chase. Hopefully you get the call up back up at the big club here soon and, and get a play maybe in the postseason. So we'll be cheering you on. All right. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks once again to listening to today's episode of the Moonlight Graham Show. And even though I do most of the interviews here on the podcast, there is a ton of work that happens behind the scenes that you guys don't see that make each episode possible. So I got to give a shout out to the Moonlight Graham Show team. First of all, Brian Sandvig, our producer. Brian does all of the post-production work. And in real life, he's not just a podcast producer. He's also a real estate agent. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home, down in the Kansas or Missouri areas, give Brian Sandvig a call. Next guy on that list is Brendan Gargano. Brendan does all of our design and artwork here on the podcast. He's one of the most talented artists I've ever met, and I love all of his work. If you need any help on the design side with logos or anything like that, give Brendan Gargano a call. The next guy on that list is Andy Flattery, my older brother. Andy, of course, has done some of the of the interviews here on the podcast. He also is a certified financial planner. He owns a business called Simple Wealth Planning. If you need any help in that area, check Andy Flattery out. And then, of course, the trusty co-host, Tom Griffin, and my younger brother, Neil Flattery. Those guys are just busy being husbands, being fathers. They're family men, but also they do a ton of work here on the show. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate you guys subscribing and supporting the Moonlight Graham Show.